Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Keith Bybee. I'm a professor at the College of Law and at the Maxwell School. And it is uh, my honor and privilege to welcome you to the second 1L Convocation Lecture of the academic year. Uh, as you know, uh, Dean Arterian and I organized this lecture series with an eye towards attracting speakers who will be of interest uh, to the larger university community, uh, but of particular interest to uh, the 1L class at the College of Law. And uh, today we are fortunate enough to be joined by Professor Robert Bartels. The title of his lecture will be, Why Supreme Court Cases Are Overrated. Uh, Professor Bartels is the Charles M. Brewer Professor of Trial Advocacy at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, which is at Arizona State University. Uh, he has litigated more than 300 civil and criminal cases in various state and federal courts, including five oral arguments uh, in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. He's published a number of articles on criminal law, and he's a co-author of a treatise on evidence. Received his BA from the University of Michigan and his JD from Stanford Law School. Uh, in addition to teaching at Arizona State, uh, he has also taught at University of Iowa College of Law and University of Colorado Law School. He has served as a special attorney, special assistant attorney general uh, for the state of Iowa and also special assistant U.S. attorney, District of Arizona. Uh, he is a very distinguished scholar and a highly experienced litigator. Um, and he will uh, be sharing some of the lessons of his experience with us today. Before I turn over the podium to Professor Bartels, let me just remind you uh, about a few uh, rules and the format of this lecture. Um, Professor Bartels will speak for about 30 minutes max, um, probably less than that and then we'll have the rest of the time for a Q&A uh, with you. If you have a question, just raise your hand, and we have a uh, people or person with a wireless microphone who will come over to you. So uh, please wait till you get the microphone to ask your question. We want to make sure that everybody can hear your question. Um, at the uh, end of uh, our time, which will be 12.50, uh, we will uh, ask that you uh, recess and leave through the main doors in the back and this will allow everybody to get to class on time. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Robert Bartels. Thank you, Keith. Uh, it's nice to be here in Syracuse. I'm gonna start just by clarifying or explaining one thing about the introduction, the, the, the special assistant United States attorney and the special assistant attorney general. And in government speak in that context, special means unpaid. Okay, and that's the sense in which I was special. So if there's one thing I'm, I'm uh, sure about after uh, over 40 years of practicing in teaching law, uh, it's that um, certainly the vast majority of law students and law professors and lawyers believe that U.S. Supreme Court cases are, and I guess I'll say supremely important, uh, and that litigating Supreme Court cases is supremely difficult and uh, impressive. And what I'm gonna spend the next 15, 20 minutes uh, uh, on is explaining why those beliefs are not true. Um, so let me though first make clear what my position is and is not. I'm not saying that Supreme Court litigation is unimportant or that it's uh, easy. Um, instead, I'm, I'm just saying that it's not nearly as important or as difficult as what lawyers do uh, every day in trial courts, in their offices, sometimes in the streets, administrative agencies. Uh, with respect to matters that are never going to reach uh, the United States Supreme 
court. And I'll come back to that comparison from time to time. Um, and I, hopefully I'll speak quickly enough to be able to, to end with a story. Um, so let me start with the, the question of importance. Uh, Supreme Court cases uh, typically involve significant issues. At least the court tries to take significant issues. Sometimes they realize after they've taken it that it's not so significant or they can't really get to that issue because of the procedural posture. Um, but, but that's the aim, and I'd say by and large they do a pretty good job of that. And uh, of course the precedential effect of a U.S. Supreme Court case on the issues they address uh, extend down to all of the state and federal uh, courts. But the actual effect uh, of any Supreme Court precedent depends on how the, the U.S. Supreme Court's decision is interpreted, applied, evaded, ignored uh, in the lower courts, uh, in the, on the streets and police stations and corporate uh, boardrooms. And the police, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court does not have the ability to police uh, the observe, the, whether people observe their opinions, their decisions. They just don't have that ability. Uh, and I'll tell you one story from my first year out of law school. I worked uh, in a legal services office in the inner city of Detroit and my secretary and her law school boyfriend uh, were arrested for possession of marijuana. And so for a while I became involved in the criminal system in the city of Detroit, and I was fortunate enough to work, get to get a lot of help from a really, really superb criminal defense lawyer, the best, still the best one I've ever known. And at some point we filed a motion just to suppress the evidence, and so we had a hearing, and I discovered then that the court scheduled about eight or nine other hearings at the same time. Um, and so we had to sit there and wait. And so I, I saw several other motion to suppress hearings and they were all pretty much the same. The officer would get on the stand and he was trying to testify about why he seized these drugs, why he searched the defendant. And at some point toward the end of the testimony, it was always the same. Um, he would say, well, and then the defendant made a furtive gesture as if he was gonna reach in his pocket. And so I, um, placed him under arrest and, and searched him. Uh, and, and, and every hearing ended the same. The, the court would deny the motion to suppress. And I was sitting next to this very good lawyer and, and, and I turned to him and I said, what's with all the furtive gestures? And he said, well, the Supreme Court just decided that if a, the suspect uh, on the street makes a furtive gesture, that that might give probable cause to search. Um, and I said, and so, and, but this judge seems to be buying this over and over and over again. Um, he's not even asking them if they know what a furtive gesture is. Um, and he said, well, you know, the reality is the judges don't see these cases unless drugs were actually found. If they search somebody and they don't find the drugs, they let them go. So, you know, the judge knows that there are drugs involved here or nobody would be trying to suppress them. Um, and that uh, influences them. So, um, and that's just, I think, a fairly typical example about how Supreme Court decisions sometimes, uh, and I don't think, I, I'm not suggesting they're all ignored completely. They do have uh, uh, intended consequences sometimes too, but not as much as you would think. Um, Supreme Court decisions are also important uh, for, for at least one of the parties in the sense that it's the last chance to uh, get a favorable ruling at least on a particular uh, issue. And, and the uh, case that I argued last year and that was decided this past March uh, is an example. Um, it was my client's last chance. If the Supreme Court had not ruled in his favor, he would have been done in terms of ever being able, as a practical matter, to challenge his two convictions with two consecutive sentences of 35 years. Uh, 
he's obviously, if he doesn't get the convictions reversed, he will die uh, in uh, prison. Okay? But the Supreme Court decision didn't reverse his conviction. And it took a while for me to get my client to understand that, uh, although I had explained to, it, it to him several times before. We just get to go back to federal court and now try to get, and this is what we're doing now uh, in a federal district court, trying to get that judge to hold an evidentiary hearing on whether my client's counsel at trial was ineffective. Um, um, the, uh, that this case I just talked about also illustrates, I think, the point that the that the Supreme Court proceeding isn't so important in another way. Um, the issue that the Supreme Court uh, granted certiorari uh, on in this case was one that uh, we raised for the first time in 2005 in uh, an Arizona trial court. And we lost on it there, and so we appealed to the Arizona Court of Appeals, and we lost there, and we petitioned for review by the Arizona Supreme Court, and they refused to review it. And we went to federal court, to the federal district court, to get our, try to get a writ of habeas corpus. And that court rejected our argument. We went to the Ninth Circuit. They rejected the argument. Um, and all of that happened before the Supreme Court, somewhat surprisingly, granted certiorari in this case. Um, and the point about that history is if we had not raised that in 2005 and lost on it, and if we hadn't kept raising it again and again and again, the Supreme Court would not have looked at that issue. They almost never will decide an issue that was not raised and litigated at every point below. So really the courts that were important, at least equally important, were the lower courts, the state trial court, court of appeals, Supreme Court, federal district court. And now it's the federal district court, which at this moment in time is uh, really uh, important. Okay, um, I have um, more to say about difficulty, but I'm gonna try to shorten it down. Um, In my view, um, an oral argument or just litigating at any part of the, of the uh, proceedings in the Supreme Court is not anything like as difficult as doing what would seem to you a simple, basic trial. Um, and I mean even a trial to the court without a, a, a jury. Uh, and so let me, let me explain why that is. Let me start just with time. An oral argument in the Supreme Court is 30 minutes per side. Okay. Uh, except in really extraordinary circumstances. And as appellate courts go, that's really long now. That was standard when I started back in the last century. But it's, you know, it's more like 10 or 15 usually. But 30 minutes. Okay. And I'll tell you one little story just to make this a little less boring um, uh, that illustrates that 30 minutes, and this is from quite a number of years ago when I was arguing a case and I was representing the respondent, which meant I got second, and normally the other side would have had rebuttal, but they used all their time, their rebuttal time on their opening argument. Uh, and it wasn't their fault, it was the court kept pestering them with questions. Um, um, and so I knew when I stood up that, that when I was done, the argument was gonna be and the system uh, uh, then, and it still is basically the same, was that uh, when you argued, uh, when you had five minutes left, a white light would appear right up here. And that just told you, you, know, you better you know, think about the fact you only got five minutes left. And so I did, but this was a, a, a case where there was a lot of emotion, uh, unusual amount for the court, constant questions, and so I kept, I was answering questions, and then after what seemed to me to be about two minutes, the red light went on. Um, um, and I sort of looked down for a minute, and I couldn't figure out what had happened, and I looked up, and all of the justices were on their feet, and they were walking out. 
Uh, and at that argument, I had kind of sneaked a couple of law students in to sit at council table with me. And so I turned to them and I said, was that five minutes? And one of them said, no, it was time and it was only two. Uh, so I looked around and I, I saw the clerk of the court. So I went over to him and I said, I'm sorry, but I, I, I'm, I'm not sure what just happened because I'm pretty sure that wasn't five minutes. Uh, and he said, oh, no, no, you have, still have three minutes left. And I sort of looked at him and he said, oh, the court always breaks promptly for lunch at noon. You have to come back at 1.30 for your last three minutes. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, there's a little in that story that also tells you something about how important the court thinks oral argument is. Uh, or at least did at that time. Now, I've, I've been told that Justice Roberts has lightened up. They're not in quite as much of a hurry to you know, get to the hot dogs and sloppy joes uh, as they were then. Um, so, um, um, trial, what about a trial? Well, I never had a trial that was over in 30 minutes. Uh, um, and the longest trial I've had, I think, was about five weeks. Uh, so something like two, three hundred times as long as an oral argument in the Supreme Court. And every half hour of a trial is more difficult than a half an hour arguing in the Supreme Court. The justices, some of them are cantankerous, um, and um, so it's not, and there's nine of them, uh, and so it's a little more difficult than the usual appellate argument. Then on a trial, you've got, you've got to worry about the witness, who's, even if it's your witness, that witness is a lot less predictable than the members of the Supreme Court. Uh, opposing counsel, the judge, the jurors, um, there are a lot of things to keep track of. And uh, there's uh, another aspect that's, that's not so bad at the trial level, but is a lot better than in the court. In the Supreme Court, they, they take an issue or two. So when you go up, you know what the issues are. And there's not very damn many of them. You can really focus. At the trial level, you've probably got 30, 40 legal issues that you've got to deal with. Um, admissibility of evidence, what's the, what are the jury instructions going to say? It's much more complicated, and what you do at trial determines what the issues are going to be um, uh, when the Supreme Court gets to decide or other appellate courts uh, review things. Um, okay. um, that sort of relates to one other aspect, uh, and that has to do with the, the facts or the evidence, the record. Uh, in the Supreme Court, you know what the record is. You know what you're dealing with. Um, and it, it gets put in a, an appendix. And sometimes the appendix of documents is pretty thick. But usually it's not. You're asked to boil it down for the court so they don't have to look at too much. So it may be 100 pages or 200 pages of excerpts from transcripts or court papers from below police reports, something like that. In, at the trial court level, and particularly before you're really in court at trial, um, the, the record doesn't even exist. You've got to find it. And the simplest event is extraordinarily complicated. Um, and uh, so it's just much harder. You're, you're dealing with virtually infinite possibilities. And you've got to figure out which ones you're going to go after. That's a big part of it. And it's a much more difficult process than just learning uh, whatever the record is that you have uh, before you. Um, so I'm going to stop there in terms of um, uh, why Supreme Court litigation isn't, relatively speaking, so difficult uh, or uh, important. Um, but I thought I also ought to say something about, so what's the point of all of this? Who cares? Um, and uh, so I thought I, 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 you may not buy this, but I do, I do have a reason why I, I did this. And, and the, 
the, the explanation really is that I'd like you to understand when you start practice that what you are going to do by and large uh, in trial courts, uh, uh, in, it, it just in your office, uh, and it doesn't really matter what it is. It may be litigation, it may be estate planning, it may be family law, um, it may be a corporate practice. Okay? What you do in those individual cases matters more than if you're doing most Supreme Court cases. Um, and so don't, you know, don't feel like what you're doing is not important. Maybe it's a small case, probably will be at the beginning. Um, but those cases matter, uh, and they matter to the people who are involved. So I'm going to st stop with, to try to make this point, I'm going to end with a, a, a story, uh, another story. Um, and I'm just going to tell you about my first client and, uh, as it happened, also my first trial ever. Uh, my, my first job after law school was in a very small legal aid office right in the middle of the inner city of uh, Detroit. Um, my first client, um, and, and I'm going to use a partially fictitious name, I'm going to call her uh, Mabel Smith. Um, Smith, of course, is not very creatively made up. Um, and, and Mabel was a very intelligent, articulate woman with 10 children under the age of 16. Right? Apparently the 10th child was the last straw for Mabel's husband because shortly after that child arrived, he left uh, for parts unknown. She, and she hadn't heard from him for a couple of years when she walked into my office. Um, so with 10 kids, uh, a full-time job was not feasible for Mabel, but somehow she managed to get by in terms of food and housing on a monthly welfare check, um, primarily. Um, okay? um, what she was not able to afford, however, uh, was winter clothing for all of her children. Um, despite a generous $22 per child winter clothing allowance from the Department of Social Services. And so, so the strategies that she adopted was to buy barely adequate winter clothing and shoes for the six oldest children and to keep the other four, including two who were school age, uh, um, at home. Uh, when it was too cold or snowy, to go to school. Detroit's not quite as cold and snowy as Syracuse, but it's pretty damn close. Um, and so there were a fair number of those days. The Board of Education responded uh, by filing a petition asking the juvenile court to remove the two youngest school-aged children from the home and put them in foster care. And uh, when I first talked to Mabel, and I was going to say I interviewed her, but she actually interviewed me because um, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, we had about two weeks before uh, the hearing. Um, and and I, I had no clue really what to do, but she, but she had a lot of good ideas. Uh, and I got some help from other lawyers. And so I got on top of what the standard was going to be that, that the judge was going to use in deciding the, this issue, and, um, and I found a, a couple of witnesses with my client's help, uh, neighbors who knew her and would testify about what a great mother she was. Um, and I, I put together what I thought was a pretty good argument. Uh, the whole thing seemed outrageous to me, to be honest, but, but I tried to make it uh, legal, legalistic and, and, you know, having never been to an evidentiary hearing before, I was a little anxious, but I felt I was prepared as I could. Uh, and uh, so I, I, on the morning of the hearing, I, I arrived, I drove down there quite a bit early because I just, you know, was feeling like I needed to be there. And I encountered my first 
practical problem, which was that I couldn't find a place to park. Uh, and so I drove around for quite a while. I finally said, oh, I gotta get to this damn hearing. And so I parked illegally right in front of the juvenile courthouse. And I just got my stuff and I walked in. Um, and when I walked into the courtroom, my client was already there, and so were all 10 of her children sitting in the audience. And I just, that made me anxious. Um, but um, I soon became more concerned about the fact that the judge and the lawyer for the Board of Education were already there and just chatting with each other, having coffee very amicably. And then the light bulb goes on. I think, God, she's this lawyer's probably been in front of this judge about 300 times and uh, that can't be good because they seem to like each other um, all right and but we persevered and I called my uh, witnesses and I gave my little closing argument during which the judge kept rolling his eyes um, which again didn't make me feel op this optimistic and then, uh, when I was done, the judge uh, surprised me a bit by asking Mabel if she wanted to say anything before he made his decision. And she surprised me, she also surprised me by saying yes. And then, and before I could put a hand on her, she stood up uh, and she said really quite calmly, Judge, I, I don't want you to take Susie and Sam away from me, but I know you can do it if you want to. I just want you to know that if you do take those two, then you're going to have to take all ten. And there they are. They're waiting. Uh, I'm going to leave all ten of them with you if you take the two. Uh, and then she just sat down. Um, <laughs> and there was a, a kind of a pause while everybody else recovered um, and and the judge wrapped his gavel and says well I'm gonna take a short recess uh, which he did and while the judge was gone I, I uh, turned to, to Mabel and I said you can't leave all of those kids here and she looked at me like I was completely stupid which I guess I was and um, said I know that and you know that but that judge doesn't know that. Okay. And sure enough, he came back about five minutes later and denied the Board of Education petition and gave Mabel a little lecture about making sure that the kids got to school as often as they could. And we were done. Um, uh, and that was the end of that uh, case. Um, the end of the story is that I walked out of the, the to the, the courthouse and looked down at my car to see a teenage boy throwing a brick through the, the rear window of my car, right in front of the juvenile court. Um, and so I learned two things out of that. One was where I, where I was living and working, you never left anything of value in your car, and you also never locked your car. Because if you did, they'd break the window and look around. Uh, so you wanted them to be able to open the door and uh, look around. All right. So um, that case never went to the Supreme Court, and we never got close to the Supreme Court. Um, but um, if I had to say, what are, what are your 20 favorite cases that you've had out of four or 500? Um, Mabel's case would be on the list. Um, uh, none of the Supreme Court cases I've done would be on that list. Uh, I think that case was more important. Uh, and, and it was more difficult, um, and it was really beyond my capacity. And I just, fortunately, my client was a very experienced client, and she knew quite a bit about practicing law. So uh, I also learned a lot from that experience. All right, now I'm done, and I hope I haven't used all of the time. Um, questions now, is that what we do? Okay. I think you're supposed to ask me questions.
Having said that, do you follow the Supreme Court very, very closely? No. Uh, okay. Um, well, it, here's what I do, um, and I've always done this, and you, whatever practical area you're going to be in, you need to do this. You need to find some advance sheet or reporters that are good in your field. In my field, I look at the U.S. Law Week, Crim Law Reporter, and something called the West Federal Case Digest or something like that. And they just give you little blurbs or stories about cases. And so I do, uh, in looking at those things, uh, I'm looking for um, appellate court decisions that might affect cases that I'm working on, or just the general area I'm in, uh, that, I, that I work in. And, you know, I care about the Supreme Court cases, and, um, you know, compared to most appellate court decisions, they are more important in terms of uh, precedent. And, you know, and sometimes the news is good, and more often it's bad, uh, given the side that I'm typically on uh, in, in criminal cases. But I don't, um, I, I'm not a student of, of the Supreme Court. Um, and and I, that's because I really mean what I just said. I don't, I, I, they're important, but um, relatively speaking, I don't think they're as important as people kind of make them out to be. I hope no, my, nobody here is going to talk to Justice Scalia or Justice Roberts or anything. I mean, you're, you're sworn to secrecy about these comments. Yeah. Um, yes. Did any of the um, the other parties in your first case know that it was your first case? The first. Oh, the trial. The trial. Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, they, they, <laughs> I suspect by the time I was done, they were kind of wondering if it was my first trial. But um, uh, no, and, and you know, in practice, uh, you frequently have that problem. I frequently have. I, I've almost, I've rarely been in a situation where I'm practicing in the same court before the same judges over and over again. The closest I came was there was a, a, a particular federal judge in Iowa when I was there for ten years. That had a lot of cases in front of him. And so I was very comfortable with the way he did things. And he was great. Um, um, but a lot of times when you're, you're in practice, you're, you're going to a court you've never been to before, or you're in front of a judge you've never been in front of. And it's, it's disconcerting because even within a particular court, the judges will vary enormously uh, in terms of how they operate. And one of the things you learn is just how to deal with that, and that it's not that big a deal. Uh, and that, you know, that the case I told you about is one where I started to learn that. I didn't know it uh, uh, in advance. Yeah. I think there's somebody outside who has a, oh, okay. Um. When you were talking about uh, the uh, furtive gestures, um, are you saying that the lower courts just don't apply it in the standard in good faith, or are they just overworked? I mean, I was a little confused. That, like, well, it's some of each, um, you know. And and, and I don't want to pick on just judges. Uh, you remember, it's the police officers who are also picking up on that. Um, and um, so some of it, I think, is just knowing they can get away with it. Uh, some of it is thinking, you know, let the Supreme Court make those stupid decisions. We know what the reality is down here that the police officers face every day. Uh, and I have a lot of sympathy, actually, with that view in the area of Fourth Amendment search and seizure. But some of it is just figuring out how are we going to contain the damage. Uh, in one of my classes, I, I always have uh, two homicide detectives from the Mesa Police Department come in to talk about 
uh, interrogation, and they, they come for four hours, and we watch a lot of tape, and they're very, very good. They're very smart guys, and they're very, I think, squared away. They're honest, um, and they want to get the right person. They don't want to just get a conviction. They're, they're if all cops were like these guys, it would be great. Um, if all lawyers were like these guys, it would be great. Um, but one of the things they talk about is Miranda, and they know it very well, um, and they know all of the subsequent case law, and they talk about how they go about getting the defendant to waive his right to a lawyer before they start asking questions. And when I ask, well, how often do you not get a waiver? They say, well, less than 10% of the time. So that's what happens to a case like Miranda. Before the Supreme Court started cutting back on what Miranda meant, um, it was sort of too late because the, 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 the police had already figured out ways to, to deal with it. And part of the reality of the situation is that it's not hard to get a defendant to waive his right. It's not that difficult. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of different ways in which these uh, decisions get interpreted. Uh, and sometimes, and often the Supreme Court is inviting a narrow interpretation. They want to decide the case narrowly. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, but that just means if it's a narrower decision, that's by definition going to have less impact. No, no, I got a question back here. Hi, um, you mentioned um, the Miranda rights in the Miranda case. Is there a point? Because I know. Um, Justice O'Connor actually once said that there's going to be a point in time where everybody's going to know their right so much that it's not going to be necessary. It's going to be irrelevant. So do you think, you're talking about the, you know, the, the Supreme Court's maybe overrated. Is there going to be specific times and instances where maybe um, some, of the, some of those Supreme Court cases will just become irrelevant as well? Or Well, there, there has been that argument made, and you know, I don't, it's been a long time since I was down kind of in the trenches uh, dealing with in a lot of interrogations, and so I don't even have a good anecdotal basis for this anymore, but, but um, based on sort of old history, but post-Miranda, um, it's astonishing how little defendants know. And the defendants who know about Miranda are the ones who have been defendants before. And they've learned about it when the police mention it to them, and then they learn about it more when they go back in their cell and all of their cellmates tell them what an idiot they were for waiving their Miranda rights. That's when they start to understand it. So I don't, I don't think it's true that every, that it's become such a, people may know, yeah, I know that name Miranda. Why do I know that name Miranda? But they can't really tell you what it is about. And for the other thing is from the point of view of a defendant who's in a, an interrogation room with a detective, um, you know, it's pretty easy to get the impression without being told much about it that it'd be better to just you know, once the lawyer gets involved, then certain options will be off the table. Okay. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not going to be able anymore to tell the judge about how cooperative you were. Okay. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's arguable that for a lot of defendants, it really is in their interest to waive the Miranda rights and just spill their guts right now. Um, so it's not... It's not that clear-cut an issue, um, and I don't think, I think Miranda has very little practical impact now, and so that more would be the, the reason 
to just say, well, let's not complicate everybody's lives. Let's not make my homicide detectives learn all that Miranda law. Because in the end, it doesn't matter. Um, I don't think we're really there. And I do think Miranda was the beginning of a process where the p police departments decided they had to get more professional right, to deal with these decisions that were starting to make them no constitutional law. Uh, and, and I think that did happen to some extent. Okay, and I think that was a good thing. So that's not, I don't think that's why the court decided Miranda the way it was. That's not what they had in mind. That's not what they were thinking about. I like, I, I like the way you've all spaced this out so that she has to walk a lot. That's, uh... I had to write out my question to make sure that I um, said it properly. But um, given your proposed lack of effectiveness or importance of Supreme Court decisions, how significant is it, um, do you think, when a previous standard or precedent is overturned, like the 2007 case of Twombly overturning uh, the Conley pleading precedent? <laughs> I'd known I was going to get a question about Iqbal and Twomley. I wouldn't have come. Um, no. um, there are decisions which I think have an impact. Um, and um, sometimes the impact is that it requires people to engage in a lot of effort to either avoid the decision um, uh, or just to figure out what in the hell does it mean? Um, and I sort of thought I understood what Twomley was saying. I disagreed with the decision. But I have to say, Iqbal, uh, I, I, I can't make any sense out of it. Okay, I think the trial courts have had that. Um, reaction to. Now I can tell you that that especially I think it's Iqbal more than Twomley though I think they both play a part. It has had an effect in the federal I think probably across the country but I'm more familiar with the federal district courts partly because I'm on the local rules committee for the District of Arizona and we just have been discussing local new local rules because of Iqbal and Twomley. Uh, and what has happened is the judges are now getting a lot more motions to dismiss than they used to. Um, and so they're getting all of this business. The evidence that I've seen suggests that there are not a lot more motions to dismiss being granted, but they have to be processed uh, and dealt with. And apparently in the District of Arizona, what my understanding from the judges on that committee is that frequently they get it and yeah, the pleading needs to be improved. And so they grant the motion with leave to amend. Okay. Um, and which means it's gonna come back to them again, maybe. Uh, and so we're now playing with new local rules to try to streamline that process. Okay, so I, it, they do have that kind of uh, impact. And in that sense, I think Iqbal has had some importance. But I don't think the court decided Iqbal the way it did to make life more difficult for federal district judges, uh, which so far I think is what's happened. I can't pretend to be unbiased about Iqbal. You have to take, take everything I said with a grain of salt. Everybody want to get the hell out of here? Uh, uh, okay. Thanks very much. Pleasure. Thanks.